Hello, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Thanks again to Oatly for sponsoring lunch and the delicious soft serve, which hopefully you all had a chance to taste. We still have two really amazing general sessions and one last closing reception. So I know some of you may have to head off for travel, but we hope you'll stay for as long as possible with us today because there's so much great content still left to come. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next general session focused on building consensus and creating buy-in at every level for plant-forward culinary training and, and education and professional development. Moderating this session is Chef Mark Erickson, who is provost here at the CIA, which means that he oversees all aspects of the college's academic programs, as well as branch campuses, food and beverage, beverage operations, and consulting. He's a graduate of the CIA, class of 1977, and a certified master chef with an MBA who's been at the CIA for many years and also has had a variety of academic and practical experiences across the U.S. and globally. Provost Erickson is a big champion for health and wellness here at the, at the CIA and across the industry, and we're very fortunate to uh, have him here today taking time out of his busy schedule to moderate this general session. So I'd like to welcome Provost Erickson in addition to all the panelists who will be joining us on stage. Good afternoon, everyone. How you doing? Having a good conference so far? Thank you, Allison, for that uh, very nice introduction, and I'm uh, very excited to be spending uh, a little time this afternoon with all of you, and uh, most importantly, with our four uh, very um, important panelists that we have here today, and we're excited to allow them to share with you all uh, their experiences and, and some insights with regards to the successes that they've had with their uh, respective organizations. Um, we're going to ask each of them to uh, give a brief sort of context introduction as to what they've been doing and what their success areas have been with their organizations. And then we're going to launch into a, a number of questions. I've got some uh, queued up for myself, but also keep in mind that we're certainly looking forward to your input of questions, and I'll be able to monitor those here on the Slido uh, screen here. So if you want to uh, submit any questions using the Slido tool, feel free to do so. And uh, we'll uh, sort of wrap up with a conversation and a series of questions, and we look forward to your input and participation. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our four panelists. So on the far side of the stage here, from the class of 2006 here at the Culinary Institute of America, we have Evelyn Garcia. Uh, Evelyn is the teaching kitchen chef at the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House in New York City. Um, I'm not going to read the full bios because those are in your programs. I think it's more important that we spend time uh, with the conversation. But certainly, uh, we appreciate having Evelyn here this afternoon. And this will be a good time to clap. <laughs> uh, next to Evelyn, we have uh, Chef David Kamen. David is from the class of 1988 here at the Culinary Institute of America. And uh, David is the Director of Client Engagement in our um, CI Consulting uh, Division of the, of the Institute. And uh, he lives here in Hyde Park, New York. We're excited to have David here today. Next with us, we have Siobhan Hansen, and Siobhan is the uh, free, uh, food choice architecture and nutrition manager at a little company, uh, you might have heard of it, it's called Google. Um, but uh, um, Siobhan has been a, a tremendous champion and has been working very closely with the Culinary Institute of America, even though she's not a graduate. We'll, we'll, we'll honor her today as a uh, honorary uh, CI uh, alumni. But uh, she has been working uh, tremendously with, uh, with us on a project that uh, hopefully she'll be able to share some insights on uh, as a part of her presentation this afternoon. Thank you. And last but not least is uh, somebody who just recently graduated from the Institute. Uh, she's a uh, class of 2019, Cynthia Madden. And Cynthia has joined the staff here at the CIA, and she serves as the uh, Menus of Change Chef Manager uh, at the Culinary Institute of America's The Egg, which is our student dining facility at the lower end of the campus, which hopefully some of you had a chance to go down there and see that facility. But uh, the uh, Menus of Change Kitchen, which is what she oversees as one of her key responsibilities, has been a tremendous addition to the, uh, to the campus environment, so we're excited to have Cynthia here as well. So with... 
With that, um, to set context, uh, we're going to ask each of you to spend just a couple of minutes. I think some of you have slides to, uh, to share with the group here to kind of describe uh, why you've been asked to participate in this session this afternoon. So uh, we're going to begin with Evelyn. So Evelyn, take it away. Absolutely. Do we have a, a little over there. Oh, clicker? <laughs> we do have one. Thank you. I love what I do, so I'll start off with that. And I think it's very important for me to um, kind of give you a little background about myself, and I promise you it's going to make sense by the end of my spiel. Um, I am going to try to keep it to seven minutes. However, I am here with my colleague, Chef Brienne Ross, who's sitting in the front row. So if you have any questions about our program, I can ramble on forever. So I'm going to try to not to do so and get straight to the point. But I am the executive teaching kitchen chef at the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. We are located in um, New York City. And as I mentioned earlier, I want to talk a little bit about myself, as vain as it may sound, but I think it's important for me to give you a little understanding of my background. I graduated in 2006. I'm a first-generation Mexican-American from Newburgh, New York, which, if you're familiar with the area, isn't the most nicest of places. But, you know, as the universe had it, as faith would have it, um, I got accepted into the CIA, I stayed for my bachelor's degree, and upon graduating, I have done absolutely everything from food service sales for PepsiCo to working in hotels, resorts. Um, I've worked in Japan, I've had the privilege of working in Florida, and I've met a lot of people along the way. And if there's one thing that I have learned is the importance of preparation is everything, which I learned at the CIA, and the importance of not burning your bridges. Um, and I've worked in food media, and I think everything kind of has essentially led me led up to working in the nonprofit sector, which isn't very common for a lot of people that have worked um, or that have, um, have graduated from the CIA. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the executive teaching kitchen chef at the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. We are a settlement house located in New York City's Upper East Side. Um, we, are, we assist 15,000 clients, um, age, ranging from the ages of 3 to 103 plus. Um, we serve meals and we offer services to two older adult centers, a women mental health shelter, a Head Start um, for children between the ages of 3 and 4, around 144 students, um, supportive housing, and an Alzheimer's support. So we offer meals to all of these, organ to, to these different outlets, which is 1,500 meals a day, 365 days a meal, and it consists of maybe a group of six to seven very amazing, very loud Dominican ladies that reside within the Bronx and Brooklyn, and they're able to bang all of this out. Our organization is 129 years, so we've been doing this for a very long time. We're good at what we do, but we're always looking to learn and collaborate and just learn um, from other organizations, other, settle, other settlement houses, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and just kind of build a community um, to see how, the, what the best practices are. So what exactly is the teaching kitchen? In short, the Teaching Kitchen is a technical support um, training program that helps nonprofit organizations that serve government funded meals. So, anything from food pantries, senior centers, early childhood centers. Um, so far, we have focused in New York City, um, the New York City area, but we're expanding um, to outside. I'll go into detail with that later. But it's to improve the health of the, the, to improve the food of those that actually need it the most. We're, we're literally serving meals to the underprivileged in New York City that have no choice and depend on these meals. So we want to emphasize the, important of, the importance of providing health and the humanity behind every meal to serve to every, um, everyone between three to 103. We want to um, support the food security system. During the pandemic, we realized the importance of providing local ingredients, being able to trace your product as much as possible. But I think most importantly, we want to focus on providing the cooks that unfortunately usually don't receive any type of technical support on how to be able to prepare themselves for guidelines that are being essentially thrown at them um, to make healthier food, more plant-based food, when they have several different barriers working against them. Whether it's working in a kitchen with one broken oven, working um, in a kitchen with no dishwasher, working in a kitchen with when you're the cook, the prepare, you're the person that delivers the food, the dishwasher, and everything in between. So having to, um, wearing multiple hats within your organization. 
to that add limited funds, to that add a language barrier, and to that add your clients that are extremely opinionated and will most definitely um, you know, share their concerns or you know, new ingredients, new dishes that are being you know, essentially forced upon them um, for health reasons. So this is what our, um, our model has um, you know, successfully been Im implemented. So it's essentially introducing other organizations, the cooks of these organizations, how they too are able to implement farm, a more healthier approach to plant-based meals. So it's, I think it's important for us to mention that everyone has an, a, a taste and health is completely subjective to several people. For some people, it could be drinking one less soda. For other people, it could be um, adding a fresh vegetable. And realistically, you have to take into consideration your means. Does your organization, do your cooks, do your clients, are they even familiar with what the best, healthiest option is? So just serving, we have a responsibility in the organizations that we serve, for the children that we serve, the seniors that we serve, to be able to expose them to healthier options. And most importantly, have it become a little bit more familiar now throughout this entire um, Menus of Change Summit. I think I've been able to relate to a lot of other panelists, you know, making sure that, you know, you remove the word vegetarian and, you know, I don't know, and change the wording on a lot of the um, in a lot of the menu that you have. But what exactly? How, how exactly are you going to be able to be more impactful to the clients that you serve? During the pandemic, we focused on being able to diversify our menu a lot more. We were focused on taking a look and actually stepping back and actually asking the questions. Where are our clients from? What are they interested in doing? And how exactly are we able to modify our, um, our current menus to make it seem more appealing to them? There, is, there are thousands of different senior centers. There's thousands of several um, early childhood centers um, in New York City. And they actually have the potential of going to other senior centers if they realize that Tofu Tuesday is not working for them. So how exactly are we able to make our food more enticing so that our current clients are open-minded um, and I guess are just more interested in wanting to try food that they essentially depend on for survival. So we have actually been able to um, come up with different recipes. We've included a lot, of more, a lot more culturally diverse recipes um, that are more familiar for our clients. We have tried everything from our own version, our healthier version, our TTK version, if you will, of pastel azteca, which is a traditional Mexican lasagna casserole if you, um, dish um, with a lot more vegetables. And our salsa verde, we've included spinach, peppers. Um, if your clients are you know, interested in the heat, that's absolutely an, an option for you. Um, we have a large Dominican population as well. So everything from a pastelon to habichuelas guisadas, um, our recipes are also emphasized on zero waste. We have a lot of organizations that have a lot of leftover hand fruit, bananas, bread. So we've de um, developed several recipes um, to be able to do just that, offer healthier alternatives um, to limit um, food cost. Um, our training is completely free. We have a lot of private funding. Um, we also offer our training in English and in Spanish. We've realized very early on that a lot of these cooks actually came to our training without any idea of what we were talking about for a full eight hours. And it wasn't until later I took it upon myself to be able to translate our, and all of our material, including our training, our cookbook, our resources, engagement tools, workshops, anything to kind of get the cooks and the clients more engaged in what was coming down the pipeline and get them more involved with you know, asking for their feedback, um, anything that would potentially change and impact what we were doing and what we were teaching the cooks of the organization. So the picture up top is a short, small picture of what our team looks like. Like I mentioned before, um, the majority of our ladies in the kitchen that crank out 1,500 meals a day, sometimes even more, um, they're some, not all of them know English. So we want to make sure that the resources that we offer our own cooks are realistic. We've been doing, we've been teaching since 2015. We've been teaching the teaching program since 2015, but it's extremely important for us to be relatable when we're teaching other organizations that serve meals and that have similar issues to the ones that we have. Let's be realistic, you know, I think as much as we like to emphasize this whole, whole farm to institution, unfortunately, local food is, isn't the lowest fruit, um, lowest hanging fruit for some of these organizations. So we just have to be realistic. Is it buying a new knife? Is it introducing a new grain? Is it, um, you know, introducing a new vegetable and just kind of assisting them without being judgmental um, and 
the most important thing is being humane throughout the entire thing and keeping in consideration that all of the food is for the clients and the clients that need it the most. Great, thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> You're very welcome. So, um, <laughs> as you can tell, Evelyn doesn't have any enthusiasm for what it is that she's doing. <laughs> Um, and I don't think it's, it's, um, it would be complete if you only take Evelyn's word for it because um, presentations from the stage can always be enthusiastic. You owe it to yourself to go to the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House website and click on the Teaching Kitchen little um, section of the, the website there and watch the little four-minute video that describes what happens there because um, uh, Evelyn seems to have uh, infected her entire team there with that level of enthusiasm, which is really what it takes to make something happen, which is it has to be done with, uh, with care and with enthusiasm. So congratulations to Evelyn on doing something uh, very um, inspiring. So. David. Well, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks, Evelyn. So, uh, again, I'm Dave Kamen. I'm the director of consulting here at the CIA, and a lot of people come up to me and say that they didn't even know that the CIA had a consulting division. So, uh, real quick, I oftentimes describe what we do as, uh, as being the now what team. So, so, here we are at the end of the conference. Uh, you're probably taking it all in and having a really good time, and tonight or tomorrow you're going to be on your way back home, and you're going to say to yourself, well, now what? Uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of when we can come in and we can help a little bit uh, your organization figure out how to do a lot of the things that were discussed over the course of, of these last couple of days. So I wanted to talk uh, today just a little bit about adding plants to your menu. Uh, if we kind of go back to yesterday when my colleague Rupa came up and, and welcomed you all, she mentioned that this conference is exactly three words long, right? And the biggest word in that is the word change. Well, uh, we all know that nobody likes change, uh, except maybe a wet baby. So, so how do you uh, instill change in your organization, and how can you take your organization and start thinking about the changes that we've been discussing here over the last, uh, last two days? So a couple of the strategies that we like to employ with different organizations, first of all, is to lose the labels. Uh, anytime you put a label on something, you're already pigeonholing yourself into some type of preconceived notion. Um, so we don't want to call the things that we're doing healthy or plant forward or vegan or, or anything like that. We just want to make them sound really, really good. Uh, I did a project last week at, uh, at uh, Los Angeles City of Hope, and their goal was to make hospital food better. And I said, stop right there, because as long as you're calling it hospital food, it doesn't matter how good it is, it's still going to be hospital food or airplane food or army food or, or whatever the case may be. Let's just focus on making the food better. Uh, so if you take a look at the menu clip that's up on the wall there, this is a restaurant called Supper, which is down in, uh, in San Antonio. Uh, and uh, if you read the descriptions there, nothing is referred to as plant forward or plant based or plant anything, yet it all sounds really, really delicious. And that's really what we want to start with, is making it sound really good. So when your guests get that menu, they get that first wow, which is, wow, that sounds good. And that's what's going to want to make them uh, order the food. Another thing that we can think about is just going global. There are so many dishes out there in the global world that are, by definition, just by naturalness, uh, plant forward, whether they're tagines or stir fries or mezes or heroes or tacos or, or any one of these things that come from areas where uh, meat is not the dominant thing that they have on their menus like here in the United States. So just by taking inspiration from all of the different global regions in the world, uh, we can find some wonderful plant forward ideas that we can then go ahead and capitalize on. Uh, bowls, as I'm sure you all agree, is the latest and greatest, wonderfulest new thing. Uh, put everything in a bowl and enjoy it like it is. Well, here's a great opportunity for us to lay on the grains, lay on the legumes, lay on the vegetables, uh, and also uh, you know, give meat uh, a little bit of its due as well, but just not in such a quantity. right? The whole idea about a plant-forward menu is that it is not meat-free, and that's probably one of the things that we need to keep in mind to convert more people than, than maybe we're able to currently. Uh, make the meat good, make the meat you know, really desirable and craveable, but also load up the dish with lots of other things that are inside there. Uh, and that kind of leads over to this concept of flipping the protein, a concept that was introduced right here 
uh, at a Menus of Change or a, uh, a university uh, collaborative a bunch of years ago. Uh, let's just take away that idea of this big old piece of meat at 6 o'clock and three haricot verts and, and, and two baby carrots, you know, up at, at 10 and 2. Uh, there are lots of ways that we can flip it around and, and have uh, more balance on your menu, and there's a little web address you can go to to see some great examples of that, uh, of that concept of the, of the pro protein flip. Uh, blending the protein, uh, I don't know if anybody from the Mushroom Council is here today, but uh, they'd be happy to hear me say that uh, you can add about 30% mushroom to ground beef uh, and have a burger or a meatball that is almost indistinguishable and that little ad up there is from Sonic. Sonic pulled this off a bunch of years ago. I think it's still on their menu, which is proof enough of concept for me that it actually works. You can use as much as 50% uh, chopped up mushrooms in a bolognese sauce or a chili or, or a sloppy joe or anything like that that doesn't have to hold together in a patty. You can add up to 20% lentil inside there as well and, and still be able to maintain a wonderful texture. There is lots of other room in there for different grains and different legumes, white bean puree and an egg salad, tofu and a chicken salad. So there's lots of ways we can blend that protein to take down the amount of animal protein and elevate the amount of, of plant protein. Uh, and then finally, we have to think about choice architecture. We have to think about how we're going to market this to people. Uh, and again, it's all about making it sound really, really good. Uh, it's also about making it more accessible, make the plants stand out, make the meat harder to find, which is exactly what we did uh, at Google uh, a bunch of years ago with the U.S. Air Force. Uh, this is exactly what's happening at LinkedIn right now, where they're just putting all the plants, all the grains, all the legumes, all of that right out front. And if you want a piece of meat, you can find it, but it's way back over there. You actually have to work a little harder to get to it, and that's going to have people uh, just spend a little more time uh, with the plant products and a little bit less time with the, uh, with the animal products. So, so one of the things that we do have, and we have some colleagues uh, in the audience from a company called Lobster Inc., uh, we do have a digital video training series that really gets into all about plant forward and how to be and how to cook a little bit more plant forward at scale. So I want to run this trailer for you, then I'm happy to answer questions uh, later on. You'll be able to see me walking around uh, later on in the, in the event. So let's, uh, let's check this out. There's a shift in consumer demand that's already underway. Will your kitchen team be in the driving seat or will you be playing catch up? Leading during this change requires a team who thinks differently about the role of plants in a 21st century diet. With the skills to match, Plant Forward Kitchen, a training program created by the Culinary Institute of America, will equip your team with contemporary thinking and plant-centric culinary skills to deliver sustainable and flavorsome plant-based offerings at scale. 19 courses deliver interactive learning to cooks and chefs on any device and in multiple languages. And because Plant Forward Kitchen is powered by the Lobster Inc. platform, managers can easily assign training, manage progress, and report on training performance and other analytics. Reframe the way your team thinks about plant-based cooking and lead the change with Plant Forward Kitchen. I do want to acknowledge that the Plan Forward Kitchen video series was created with a very generous grant from, uh, from our friends at Google, uh, and it was actually developed uh, with Google as a partner to really look at not just Plan Forward Cooking, but Plan Forward Cooking at scale. So it's, it's not even just about creating a few portions of food, but how do you do it for, uh, for hundreds at a time? And, and that's all located inside there. So more about that a little bit later on, and uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thanks, David. You know, it's a kind of a little inside joke here that this CI has secrets too, and, and one of them, unfortunately, is the fact that the CI has a consulting division, so hopefully Dave has uh, uh, dispelled that, uh, that myth that uh, uh, we don't reach outside the four walls of the Institute, and uh, as he's already queued up, um, Dave uh, described our relationship, which has been incredibly uh, um, productive for us, and I, I think for the industry, working with Google, and it was through a 
um, a series of conversations that led to an, an incredibly generous grant from Google that we're able to put together um, the Plant Forward program that Dave just talked about. And so uh, representing today, uh, we have Siobhan today, so I look forward to hearing her teeing up what's going on at Google. Thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. Um, super happy to be here. A lot of people ask the question, and I'll dig right in just to give you some context about food at Google um, and why is Google talking about food. Um, we have an amazing vision at our company to contribute to feeding the world responsibly and sustainably through our Food at Work program and really off, um, uh, supported by Alphabet and all of the incredible technology that's happening, acro happening across our ecosystem. Our mission really inspires the, the small food team and our partners, our extended workforce, um, to help us inspire and enable the Google community to thrive through food experiences and through food choices. Um, so we create amazing experiences for our Googlers. We believe it helps them to be more productive, um, really turn out better products, um, to, to really increase their performance. And I was sitting with a young engineer just a couple of days ago, and just he talked about the food program and how it has really helped to uh, just enable him and support him. He loves it. He loves the teaching kitchen classes that we have. He loves uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, he spends his time at work, and it really helps uh, to deliver an amazing experience for him. So it was just an, an amazing touch point and reminder that this is a very individual um, and, and touches a lot of people's lives. It really helps to support the culture that we're trying to build. From the very inception of the company, uh, food has been a central part of the way in which Googlers connect to build teams and, and team leaders to support their team goals and to attract and retain talent. So again, very much embedded in what we do. So this, gives you, this slide gives you a little uh, better sense of the scale and how we're operating. 367,000 meals a day, um, 13,000 associates. We have an incredible host of vendor partners that help us deliver our food system, food um, services across 58 countries and over 380 cafes. We've got a lot of extended programs beyond the day-to-day -day cafes like teaching kitchens, micro kitchens, food trucks. Um, we organize our work under the frame of five food shots, and Google loves moonshots. Um, our fearless leader, Michael Bacher, framed um, food shots as our way to really think about our aspirational future. And so these food shots really help us organize our work, organize our partnerships, and these are to enable individuals to make personal and informed choices, a very important one around shifting diets, which I'll primarily focus on in um, what I share with you today, enhancing food system transparency, reducing food loss and waste, and the transition to a circular food economy. Just a quick mention on partners and how important and vital they are to helping us do what we do. As I mentioned, our vendor partners help us execute our program every day. Compass at Google, Sodexo at Google, Guggenheimer at Google, we could not do what we do without our incredible vendor partners. The CIA is another one, and, and just helping us to produce the expertise around the Plant Forward Kitchen. We are so fortunate um, to be so deeply connected with the expertise of, of CIA. And I'll, t I'll talk about a couple of other partners. But this is also one of the SDG goals. It's, it's uh, SDG goal 17. It's about partnering for the goals. So if we want to accomplish food system transformation, we deeply believe in the essence of partnership. Uh, this gives you a sense of our Plant Forward Kitchen vision. And David talked about this, building and empowering a team of global chefs to produce delicious meals at scale. This was one of the key areas of the vision for this particular program to also grow an understanding of how to deliver balanced plant-forward cooking consistently across low, medium, and high volume execution. And we've got all of them. We have very large sites, we have very small sites. We needed this to be able to scale across um, different levels of volume. And then to deliver a tiered certification approach to plant-forward cooking. We've got lots of different culinary professionals at different skill levels, and so this needed to meet a variety of skill levels. 
This shows you very quickly, I won't go into too much detail, Michael Kahn is here in the audience, and, and if you want to unpack this a little bit more about how we're rolling it out across our ecosystem, I thought you would be interested. Again, it's important to think about the different skill sets that we have. We've got line level chefs, and we want them to have foundational knowledge of how to prepare delicious vegetable dishes. But we also have culinary managers and people who have deeper, richer skills and need to understand more around the sustainability and the nutrition and world cuisines. Um, so this varied and tiered approach was really important to us. Um, we, talking about another partner, we knew that education was not going to be enough. And the Food for Climate League, Sophie Egan presented yesterday, is an amazing partnership that we have to really break down and understand the intrinsic motivation of chefs. And this has been a wonderful build and amplification of the Plant Forward Kitchen. This is really helping us understand what's at the heart of every single individual culinarian who's executing our Plant Forward Kitchen promise. Um, so we set off to think about how can we intrinsically motivate each of these chefs to better understand what Plant Forward uh, Cuisine is all about. So we set aside some time, some piloting, and really started to ask deeper questions around what was motivating. What are the barriers? What are the challenges? What are the perceptions? And what is the readiness of people to really take on this new information? And so we went through a series of pilots. We conducted surveys. Um, and we engaged in a much deeper, richer way the, a deeper understanding of where people were in their journey and what they needed and wanted to learn about and how they could connect to some of their cultural experiences. And this became a deeper question and, and a set of um, opportunities for us to delve more deeply into how we could really change the hearts and minds of our culinarians across the globe. So this gives you a look at what intrinsically motivating plant-forward cooking is all about, what it looks like. Workshops, feedback systems, narrative building, and skill building. And I won't go into to detail. We can talk about it maybe a little bit more in some of our discussion. Um, but we got really great results as we put um, our culinarians through the workshops. Most importantly is the 78% of individuals who went through the workshops signed up for the Plant Forward Kitchen. They were deeply motivated, again, very connected to uh, the vision of the Plant Forward program and wanted to sign up to take it. So we believe this was an important partnership to help amplify. The last partnership I want to talk about is the Beans as How campaign. This is an amazing opportunity for us to take the communications angle, targeting restaurants, caterers, cafes, schools, anybody touching food to really drive beans as an opportunity to be a, a solution on the plate to address climate change and sustainability. It's a very simple campaign. The goal is to double bean consumption by 2028. And signing up for this program is very easy. This gives you a, a few steps on how to accomplish that. And then just lastly, our goal is really to create this surround sound experience. So as I mentioned, partnerships are so critical to this. Building the Plant Forward Kitchen was first and foremost, it's really the foundation of how we can help amplify and, and drive plant forward con consumption across our ecosystem. The uh, Food for Climate League intrinsic motivation was a nice add-on and build, and then the Beans is How campaign and the communications are another layer to really help drive success. So with that, I'll close and we'll, we'll chat more about um, all of these partnerships next um, as we go along. I want to compliment uh, Siobhan and the entire Google Food team since this has been a journey that we've been on for six years, I, th I think. And uh, through the process, it's been really wonderful because we, we work with lots of different organizations, but this is one in which I've learned a lot about how business gets done at Google and uh, have learned a lot what makes Google Google. And part of it has been the idea that um, we started off with a shared vision, but not a, an exact plan as to how we were going to get there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but we launched anyway, and in working with Google, there's a tremendous amount of feedback that's drawn from the experience and put back into the system and refined. So this idea of, of ready, fire, aim uh, really works at Google and has really um, caused Google to glow uh, in the, uh, the realm of what they're doing there with their, their program for the employees. So we're, we're excited to be a partner of that and, and wonderful to learn with Google along the way. So, Cynthia. Um, Running the, the Menus of Change kitchen at the Culinary Institute of America is, a, is a, um, a huge responsibility and with a very critical audience, which is our students, because uh, we teach the students at the CI to be uh, critical about food, and, and they are. So um, I'm sure you've had a lot of great experiences, and we look forward to hearing uh, what's going on with the, with the program that you oversee. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the Culinary Institute for entrusting me with a microphone, first of all, in a public setting with an exceptionally captive audience. Um, I am by no stretch a public speaker, so I will be heavily reading off of my notes today. <laughs> um, again, my name is Cynthia Madden. I am the chef manager of the Menus of Change kitchen here at the Hyde Park campus. Our focus is to share plant-forward meals uh, <laughs> that abide by the sustainability initiatives under the Menus of Change principles with the student community as well as the faculty and staff here on campus. Given our topic of discussion today and breaking down the approach, it's worth taking a step back to reconsider how Plant Forward is defined in practical application in order to achieve these goals of creating buy-in at every level to attract, retain, and invest in one's own staff. When I receive students Oh boy, there it goes. When I receive students in the beginning of a menu cycle, I often receive the following question. What does plant forward mean? I can give them a lengthy answer, but then I quickly see that weird glaze they get over their eyes. And despite the information that's provided to them on any resource I could give them, all they've heard and processed is, oh, chef, there's no meat. Sorry, hard pass. Uh, so then how do we define plant forward for the naysayers? And it really begins with the understanding that food is not just a personal choice. It's a hardwired experience. So I am actually going to interact with all of you today and share an exercise that I've done with a few students already. And that is I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and not just for the fact that it stops you all from staring at me at the moment, um, but I promise it's part of the example. So if you close your eyes and imagine your favorite foods on one menu, how many of them are childhood favorites? What emotions are elicited? Is it comfort? Is it joy? Is it love? And in keeping your eyes closed, now think of the word plant forward. What emotions stir up now? Do you immediately dismiss the concept? The is there a rise of skepticism, even anxiety, a little bit of fear? How many of you immediately thought, I do not want to have to sacrifice my favorite foods to make the change? It's in these thoughts and emotions that are the deciding factors in making the healthier, sustainable, more viable food choice. When it comes to attracting employees, it boils down to why bother making something I cannot connect with on a personal level, especially if I have no other point of historical reference I can fall back on to trust. This is the daily challenge of the Menus to Change Kitchen. So then what's the solution? How do we overcome the barrier of turning fear into trust so we can bridge the gap in creating the desire to attract and retain employees? We have a diverse population here at the CIA, 10% of which is in international students on campus. And in training our students, they need to know how to diversify, not just for the sake of a menu cycle or creating, developing their own menu, but understanding when thinking about sustainability or farm to table. It's not just about the locality or seasonality of the produce we're working with, it's also about understanding the diversity and synergy of the spice blends in applying global flavor profiles. It's understanding when these flavors are executed properly. It has a profound effect in building a personal connection with our students and our student hires, 
leading to exercising the trust factor. I receive requests often from our international student population here to represent their naturally plant-based dishes from home, more often than not. And when this occurs, I invite them into the kitchen to work with my students. They provide recipes from home. They show us their methods on how to cook alongside with myself and my students. And the students that provide these recipes and these home methods, essentially, they teach our palate of what the final product should taste like. Not just our take on what it should taste like if we just received the recipe and the method. The entire experience works on a multitude of levels. It shows we're paying attention when considering student food choices. It shows we respect and honor their heritage. And in terms of developing our student hires, they've now expanded on the knowledge and techniques they've been introduced to in their kitchen lab classes here, thus adding value to their education. And now we can discuss the implications of the trust factor that's layered into the textbook definition of plant forward. As I explained to my students, when you're preparing our meals, I'm not asking you to be all in on day one. Instead, I'm asking for you to consider taking the first steps towards curiosity. I provide them with one small task that progresses to larger tasks throughout the week, rewarding and reinforcing in order to recondition the operant and learning behaviors of those students. This reconditioning can be achieved through diversification of the learning process allowing room for innovation, ultimately bridging the trust factor with engaging the students in the process along the way. In terms of innovation, our students are not just encouraged to critically think, but to create, be create, provide creative solutions. At our kitchen, there's a progressive learning pattern into, that is folded into our menu cycles, allowing opportunities for students to make their own menus at the end of the week. Providing this opportunity, excuse me, providing this opportunity reinforces the foundations of trust that are built at the start of the week. From one small task that builds into a larger task, so on and so forth. Until these students are asked to make their own plant forward menu using only the surplus that's left in house. This is a hands on approach allowing for a multifaceted experience incorporating problem solving abilities along with technique applications, product knowledge, and expanding on the earlier mentioned diversification of profiles. It's from this experience they learn to value their time, value their efforts, and make that personal connection to that food, ultimately learning how to care about what they're producing and how that affects and impacts the other students that are coming up to our station. They become cognizant of their choices moving forward. And that's what, that's what, sorry. Again, not a public speaker. <laughs> um, they learn to make the connection between themselves, their work product, and their food choices. Lastly, throughout the entirety of my ranting for the last few minutes, and not so eloquently. Uh, student engagement and interaction has been an important theme in building the foundation of the trust that leads to the reconditioning of learned and operative behaviors mentioned earlier. And I'll say since my start here, I provided my student hires with projects and assignments that have a weighted impact on the kitchen program as a whole. And when approached with the opportunity to take part in yesterday's poster session, sorry, the results of that trust that has been built between my student hires and myself was displayed in their work product. For the last eight weeks, my team has been all in, elbows deep, both feet in. They were dedicated to the project to each other, to myself, and to the program as a whole. 
and they, have, they displayed everything they learned along the way. That trust factor was strong. Their training and experience created the desire for buy-in as a team. They defined Plant Forward in its practical application, utilizing diversification and innovation alongside their education here at the CIA. And if I'm being honest, my team, my students, they are the connection in creating the impact necessary in determining the desire for Plant Forward moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, and I think we've now seen an example as to why she's been so effective with our Menus of Change Kitchen. It's about commitment and engagement and working with passion with our students, so uh, congratulations to Cynthia and the impact that she's having here at the Institute. So, With that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to pose a few questions to the group here, because um, obviously uh, four different um, points of, not, not opposing, just different points of view to a similar uh, issue and opportunity. And I think, um, Evelyn, I'm going to turn to you first, because one of the things that commonly comes up when we talk about implementing a plant forward initiative in an operation, especially those that are in a little bit more budget challenged environments like the ones that you uh, engage with, um, there's always this thought that, well, you know, to do plant forward well requires more labor, um, and therefore it's, in, it's not accessible to us. You've proven that to not be true. So what's the secret sauce that, that you've been deploying there to make, make that happen? So the truth of the matter is that fresher ingredients do require more labor. And I think there has to be a sense of transparency when we are pitching our program. Um, like I said before, we have trained um, cooks from multiple, from multiple skill levels. Some are actually trained. Now we've noticed that, for example, here at the CIA, you have the master's program. Students are actually interested in going into essentially more nonprofit organizations with more food policy um, positions. Um, so they have an extensive you know, uh, knowledge on fabrication and skill set. Um, most importantly, they come with their own knives. And that is something that a lot of the organizations that we train Realistically, you go in and they're actually fabricating fresh broccoli, if that's even an option, with something similar to a butter knife. So we have to be realistic as to what veg if you're looking to integrate a new vegetable, what vegetable makes sense? It can't be butternut squash because you're working with a, a butter knife to fabricate this. But perhaps we can, you know, think about another ingredient that makes more sense. Perhaps we can, instead of a vegetable, we can focus on a grain a grain, whether it's barley, um, bulgur, even brown rice and another, uh, and another grain. Combining them, cooking them, using the equipment that you already have. You have limited stovetop space, but you have multiple ovens that you can use. You know, it doesn't require more skill. It doesn't require you to learn how to turn on the oven. It's just essentially using what you have and you know, meeting them halfway. And I think when I mentioned earlier the importance of me kind of talking a little bit about my background, I did not grow up eating broccoli. I did not grow up eating kale, Brussels sprouts, you name it. The vegetable that I was given was essentially what my mom found in the freezer in a can, and I have to be able to relate with a lot of the clients, with the, um, the cooks that are cooking this stuff, and realistically, what makes sense for your organization, what makes sense for your clients, and what can we use, assess what we have to be able to adapt to what the skill level, equipment you have, the budget that you have, and you can still make change. It doesn't have to be a vegetable, it can be a grain. It can, your first goal can be buying a new knife. That in itself is five, ten dollars, and that will give you um, the accessibility to actually be able to, in the near future, possibly fabricate butternut squash, if you so decide to, but just, I think, being realistic and uh, meeting them with whatever they have and just, you know, pushing them into wanting um, more sustainable goals that make sense for them. So, sounds like the operative word there is adaptability. Correct. Good. Um, David and Siobhan, the, the program that's going on at Google obviously represents a, you know, kind of cutting edge uh, an implementation in an organization that is uh, very open to change. Um, you know, looking outside of, of the Google sphere um, and with some of your other clients, uh, David, 
Um, what are the most common challenges that you encounter when you start talking about uh, this concept of getting buy-in in an organization to implement a, an initiative such as Plant Forward or however you describe it? What's, what's, the, what's the big um, overcoming need? Yeah, you know, I think the big barrier to entry right now is, is what Evelyn is talking about. It's, it's just the, the, the knowledge and the talent to be able to, to apply you know, these, these ingrained techniques and these ingrained ideas into something a little bit different. And, and we, we have to remember that, for the most part, cooking is cooking. And if you're going to grill a steak or you're going to grill a cauliflower, you're really not doing too much different. Uh, you know, we, we kind of have to embrace the fact that we've, we've given ourselves permission to no longer boil vegetables, that we can take things and we can roast them and we can grill them and we can char them. Uh, so a big barrier to entry is, is really it's giving ourselves permission to think differently, uh, to do things a little bit differently using the techniques that we, we already know how to use, we just don't really understand how to apply from, uh, you know, from an animal product to, to a vegetable product. Good. And Javon, something that's been sort of um, scratching at me ever since we began our initiative together at Google is the, the packaging of the message around um, a plant forward concept and, and how do you, especially in an environment where um, the clientele, uh, and meaning the Google employees, are very educated and um, the plant forward message um, needs to be simple enough to be able to deliver, but you have a group that is looking for oftentimes scientific evidence or proof or wants to debate just by their nature. So how has that been working at Google? What are, what are you doing in order to keep the message simple, but at the same time, you know, respond to some of those inquiries? Right. Well, we have to think about the fact that there are two different audiences that you're kind of relating to. When we deal with Googlers, they want data. So we know that we need to package it up and um, be at the top of our game as it relates to what's out in the science and, and be able to um, converse with deep expertise. As we think about our culinarians who are taking on board the um, Plant Forward Kitchen, I would go back to what we learned a lot through our Food for Climate League experience was the importance of compelling reasons for plant-forward cooking, consistency in the way that we messaged, building a narrative that made sense and that resonated with their hearts and minds. Uh, and the excitement we started to see with the culinarians who were, um, we spent more time with and we helped unpack the opportunity that they had and the role that they had in driving the agenda around plant forward um, cooking and cuisine, it was incredible. We, were, we are so excited about what we're seeing with this additional layer on top of the education to bring their hearts and minds along. Um, we're just super excited about it. Good. So on the theme of education, Cynthia, I think you probably have a, uh, a unique perspective that I'm really curious to learn uh, from you, and that is um, you're a recent graduate, but now you are uh, working with students and kind of engaged with them at where they are in the uh, concept of what the future looks like and, and what they're experiencing. What do you think that means for the curriculum at the Culinary Institute of America for now and into the future compared to your experience as a student? That is a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think thus far, when communicating with the students and receiving their student feedback, I think moving forward, they're going to really want to learn, how, again, learning what plant forward means and how that is applied in a practical kitchen setting. They want to learn the techniques because not uh, they, when, they, when they're here, they receive foundational knowledge. And I think from there, we really need to learn, they need to learn, rather, how to build on that knowledge. And not just from like a French, uh, uh, excuse me, not just from the way that they're taught here, but there are other parts of the world that are more plant forward that are naturally plant-based and have been working with, with plant-forward and plant-based foods for thousands of years before this movement as a whole has even began to take place. And I think we need to start digging deeper into 
educating our students more in the global cuisines, the ones that are more naturally plant-based, so that way when they move forward out into the workforce, they're armed with knowledge that they can take anywhere with them and they can go from one type of themed restaurant to another or they go from one large corporation to another and we, we really need to educate them in arming themselves with as most, knowledge, as most knowledge as possible in whether it's vegetable cookery or if it's uh, product knowledge in grains. I can't tell you how many times I've introduced a student to bulgur. They're like, I don't know what this is. I've never seen this before. Well, you're seeing it now. Let's learn about it. <laughs> and I think uh, product knowledge at best is a great way to start introducing them to what plant forward, what our, at the very least a plant forward curriculum um, should focus on. Yep. It seems that um, sort of common amongst the conversation this afternoon is this idea that, um, and I think David described it, is that people are not excited about change, and um, the word change oftentimes will throw up um, barriers uh, because people resist change immediately. But to start with the familiar um, and to talk about how, instead of different it is, is how familiar plant-forward cooking can be, especially if you're drawing from things that they already know, whether it's the technique or um, ingredients and exposures that they've had to certain global cuisines that might be different to them but it's not change, it's an exploration of something that's new and exciting. I think that's really what the opportunity is for this entire initiative is to uh, make it something that's digestible um, as a, um, an exploration of, of something new that is a discovery rather than just simply uh, promoting the idea of change because I think that's gonna be um, something that's uh, gonna put a, be a barrier to adapt, adapting um, and accepting uh, what this concept really is, which is about pushing things forward. So, great. So, uh, I think we have just a few seconds here for some questions from the audience. And um, I think somebody here has one that was, I, I love the idea of it coming in, and that is, um, uh, this probably is best answered by you, David. It says, is the Plant Forward Kitchen going to be available to other institutions? I'm sure you have an answer for that. Well, it's, it's not a matter of if it's going to be, it absolutely is. So, the Plant Forward Kitchen video series uh, is available for subscription uh, right now. Uh, you can chat with me about it, or we have uh, Marcel and Liz from Lobster Inc. Are, are out here in the audience, and any of us can, can tell you how you can, you can get a hold of it. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's a great opportunity because, as, as we're all suggesting, it's, it's a lot of it is about education and, and understanding those skills and techniques and how those techniques are applied. And, and one of the enhancements we can offer to that is, is not only do we have the Plan Forward Kitchen video series, but we also do what we call a mentor training program. So uh, we actually teach people how to use the video series as a teaching tool. And, and that also is one of the elements of our partnership with Google, where we worked with, uh, with some of the senior Googlers, uh, some of the district managers and, and cafe managers uh, to be those trainers uh, to learn how to use these, uh, these video systems as a training tool. And now that's kind of filtering down to, uh, to the cooks within those organizations, uh, literally across, across the world. So, so that's absolutely available right now. Great, thanks. And then uh, our last question, because we're running out of time, but it uh, seems to be something that Siobhan can answer, and that is, why are beans specifically the pulse, which would help the environment if consumed more? Well, it's a wonderful protein source. So if you think about not fully eliminating um, animal-based protein, but adding beans, it can just replace um, those individual foods that we know have a heavier carbon load. And we have said choice is fundamental across Google. We're not removing um, animal products, but we're using them in a very thoughtful, responsible, and judicious way. Um, and the addition of beans is one wonderful way that we can um, add, be additive, in delivering delicious plant-based eating. Great. 
And uh, you know, Cynthia is currently the uh, Menus of Change uh, kitchen manager, but we actually, we just got a question from your predecessor, uh, Alexandra Cherabelli, who was formerly uh, the, uh, the manager of the kitchen, sent in a question, and um, her ask is, uh, what are some of your favorite dishes from the Menus of Change kitchen, and have any student dishes become staples of the kitchen? Yes, so thank you, Alex. Um, we actually served one yesterday. It, we, my students and I created a, a black bean beet and quinoa burger, and we incorporated some Middle Eastern spices into it. And that seems to have kind of taken a life of its own. I think the first time we ran that, uh, we had people coming back to the station and saying that it was a magical experience, and that's not something I ever get here. Normally, it's just cr criticism. Um, so that, that's one of them. We actually had another student last semester. We had an issue with somebody overcooking bulgur, um, and we kind of put our thinking caps on. We said, what can we do with this? There's a lot here. Let's not have it go to waste. And a student came up with the MLC crunch wrap. So we run that uh, at least once a cycle. Yeah. Well, um, it's amazing how quickly an hour goes by when you have people talking about something that they're very passionate and knowledgeable about, and that certainly has been the case uh, this afternoon with this group. So join me in thanking our panelists today, uh, Evelyn, David, Siobhan, and Cynthia. So thank you so much. Thanks again to our panelists. We are now heading into a short networking and refreshment break downstairs, sponsored by My Forest Foods. And we're going to be back here at 3.30 for our closing keynote. So see you back here at 3.30.